Well, we're, we're ready to move forward with our speaker. If you could go to the next slide, please, Frank, and uh, we'll turn the mic over to uh, Karen Yarbrough. And I want to just say on behalf of the club, uh, Karen Freeman Wilson, that we're, uh, we're honored. And you know, people say that often in introductions and speeches, but there's no question that we're highly honored for you to take time out to speak with us today. And we look forward to your remarks and we thank you for your leadership in the Urban League. Karen? Well, good afternoon to all of you Rotarians. We have a treat today because we're going to hear from the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson. Now, I'm sorry I can't be with you um, on this call. Uh, I mean, I, you can't see my shining face, but I'm uploading some changes to my computer and it won't let me do it. But nonetheless, I'm here and I'm just thrilled that um, Karen um, was so graciously accepted our invitation to be uh, our speaker today. Let me just give you a little background. This lady's been a lot of places and done a lot of great work, and she's going to come to us in her own way to discuss the great programs that they have at the Urban League. She is currently serving as the president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League, and she started in January of 2020. She brings a passion for equity and social justice to the organization, which works to advance economic, educational, and social progress for African Americans through <laughs> direct service and advocacy. Um, the clerk's office previously worked with the Urban League with um, some of our programs, and they're just a terrific organization to work with. Karen, having served in the public arena most of her professional life, has deep experience in addressing issues that impact urban community. She's one of these people who looks to not the symptoms, but rather than the root causes of issues and addresses those. She most recently was mayor of her hometown of Gary, Indiana from 2012 through 2019. She was the first female to lead the city of Gary and the first African-American female in Indiana. Her mayoral accomplishments <laughs> include job creation, completion of a hundred million dollar airport runway location and the development of key areas in the city. She previously served as attorney general, director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission and presiding judge of the Gary City Court. She also served as executive director of the National Drug Court Institute and also the CEO of National Association of Drug Court Professionals, where she's currently a board member. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Did I tell you she was a bad sister? She is a past member of, a president actually, of the National League of Cities, past advisory board member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and currently sits on the National Police Foundation, Cities for Financial Empowerment, African Americans, Mayors, Advisory Council, Board of Directors, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. After all of that, she and her husband, Carmen, have a blended family of four children. Didn't I tell you she was a powerhouse? Karen, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Clerk Yarbrough. And it's an honor to be with you and certainly to be with the um, Rotary Club. I wanna first thank you for your service to Cook County and certainly want to thank the Rotarians for your service to um, the community for the greater Maywood uh, community. You all are doing some wonderful things and um, I'm gonna see if I can't uh, uh, at least support the upcoming program because it sounds like a wonderful event. Um, so thank you for inviting me to share with this Lunch and Learn series. I saw the other speakers and I'm honored to be included among such a great group of servants and leaders. Uh, what I'd like to do during the time that I have is to talk about 
the Urban League, uh, the amazing work that we're doing. And I then would like to just give you a, a brief window into my journey. Um, I have the distinct privilege and pleasure of leading the Chicago Urban League, an organization that has served the community uh, of greater Chicago for over 105 years. That is a long time. And, um, and the great thing about the league is that just like we were over 105 years ago, uh, we are still relevant. And, you know, it wouldn't be Black History Month without just a small history lesson about the creation of the league. Many of you are aware that 105 years ago, there was a great migration of people from all points south. Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, certainly parts of Alabama and Georgia. And um, as they moved north, many of them came to Chicago. Uh, my grandfather was a part of that great migration. Of course, he came from Mississippi and uh, went a little further east to Gary. But as they came to Chicago, the new migrants to Chicago needed an organization, needed a process of settling in. And part of that process was the whole settlement house movement. And I know you all are familiar with Ada Ho. But the other part of that was the Urban League. And in that process, the Urban League worked with new residents of Chicago to help them find jobs, to help them find housing, to help them uh, get their children educated, and to help them essentially become acclimated to their new house. Um, at that time, we were located, um, when we first uh, began providing services in the old Swift Mansion. Well, actually, prior to that, we were located not far from the Swift Mansion. We got into the Swift Mansion, and when we outgrew that location, we built a building right next door, and that's where we are today. 4510 South Michigan Avenue. And just as we provided services um, in the community during the Great Migration, we continue to provide those services today. And, you know, when you think of the great leaders whose shoes I feel, and I'm talking about none other than Bill Berry. Jim Compton, Andrea Zopp, Cheryl Jackson, uh, Barbara Lumpkin, and uh, Sherry Runner. Uh, we continue to provide um, services in the community that allow people to uh, seek social justice and equity. Essentially, that's what we fight for every day. Recently, we redid our strategic plan. And the question that we asked and answered was that if the work that we do is not dedicated to wealth building or reducing the racial wealth gap, then we shouldn't be engaged in it. So how do we do that? We do that through using our convening power the ability to bring people together to look at issues that are of concern to the Black community, but also to the larger community. One of those examples is the census. We were heavily involved in bringing groups together, bringing organizations together to work on maximizing our census count. Most recently, 
we are bringing folks together along with the Black Leadership Council and the Chicago Community Trust to look at what a Black agenda, a Black policy agenda for the city of Chicago should entail. Uh, what does it do around infrastructure, business development, education, all of those things that are of paramount importance, crime, uh, addressing crime and public safety. How do we do that uh, in the Black community and how does it connect to the larger community? But what are some of the special needs of the Black community? And so that's our role as a convener. We are also a provider of programming. I talked about housing and education and, and business development earlier. We continue to provide programming we do it in youth and family services. We do it through our Center for Entrepreneurship. We do that through housing and financial empowerment. We do that through workforce development. And we do it through the Impact Leadership Program. And uh, we are now in our eighth year of providing impact. Uh, when I think about the work that we do in the Center for Financial Empowerment, we have a Next One program, and that is a program that allows businesses to accelerate and to really grow and, again, to build wealth. But we also have business startup programs, and we don't just do them in the city of Chicago. We are also engaged in the South suburbs. Uh, in addition to the work that we do with the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, we're engaged in housing and financial empowerment. And we help people do housing every, uh, in every way from getting a new house and making sure they're able to qualify for, for a mortgage to uh, preventing foreclosure, because we know that there are challenges that come with losing jobs, uh, with the pandemic that we have all been in. And so we help people to uh, keep from getting their homes foreclosed on. In fact, right now we're engaged in a program with Experian, uh, the company that does the, um, the credit reports. And the Experian program is allowing us to provide grants to people who are in jeopardy of losing their homes. Uh, so that's what happens in housing and financial empowerment. And then the Financial Empowerment Center also helps residents to either keep their credit on track, get their credit on track, to think about what does it mean to really um, create a budget, to live within that budget, and to look at opportunities that they may have to obtain loans or to build their credit so that in the future, if they want to invest in a business, if they want to buy a house, if they want to invest otherwise, finance their children's education, they are ready because of the work with, their, uh, with our housing and financial empowerment team. We are engaged in workforce development and you know we're doing some just uh, great programs there. We just finished a session with Otis Elevator and you know um, people who repair elevators make anywhere from 30 to 40 dollars an hour. And so we wanted to make sure we were able to get Black folks in the pipeline to get those jobs with Otis. We also do tech training. Uh, we have an urban tech jobs program where we're training people in cybersecurity. We're training them in um, other software development, involvement. And then we also have a pharmacy tech program for those who want to work in pharmacies. And we know we've been in the lines at CVS and Walgreens and other pharmacies. We know that those pharmacies are always full. In addition to the work that we do with workforce, 
we are engaged with our impact leadership program. Some of you may know young professionals who have been an impact fellow. It's a nine month cohort. We help with both professional and civic engagement and development. And that's really directed to young people under the age of 40. Um, and so if you know someone who is a rising star, either in your offices and your families, we would invite them to apply for impact. We will start recruiting for our next cohort in March, and we want to encourage them to apply. We have a youth and family services program. We know that the pandemic has been particularly hard on our young people because they are social individuals. They count on being able to see their friends, to spend time with their friends, to hang out with them, their friends. And they had an entire semester where they were away from their friends because they were on the screen. So we are working with them with social and emotional learning, but we're also doing STEM training. We in fact have a STEAM camp. We have a program that we do with the Lyric Opera where our young people work with professionals in the front of the house and the back of the house at the Lyric Opera to develop a play, to perform that play, and to um, really understand how a theater, how a theater such as the Lyric Opera works. And that's called Lyric Unlimited. And we're excited about that. But we also work with them as they look to their future, whether it's college or whether they want to go into the trades or what other, whatever they think they want to do. We work with them every week to ensure that the sky is the limit for them. So that's what we do in youth and family services. We were a part of the Chicago Connected program as uh, families needed to get connected to the internet, needed devices. We worked with CPS to do that. And our latest involvement is with the Hope Chicago Scholarship Program where we will be supporting the parents because part of that program allows for training and job support for at least one parent of each Hope Scholar. The Urban League is going to be one of the organizations that will be supplying that support to parents. And so as you can see, we have been busy during the pandemic uh, and even uh, prior to that time. Um, the last thing that I'll tell you about the programming that we're involved in is in our health equity work. Because one of the things that was laid bare, quite frankly, during the pandemic was this health inequity that existed in the Black community. Both access to health care, the challenges that we had because we um, have some underlying conditions, whether you're talking about diabetes or heart challenges, all of that factored into us dying at a much higher rate during the um, uh, height of COVID-19, but we continue to die at a higher rate. And so what we have done was really stepped up our health equity work to make sure that people are aware of uh, these underlying conditions to help them to think about how do they become less um, susceptible to the underlying conditions and to encourage people to get vaccinated because we know that that is one of the ways that you can reduce the risk that you might either contract COVID-19 or die from COVID-19. Um, the last area, we have a research and policy center. In fact, we are the only Urban League affiliate with a full-blown research and policy center that is dedicated to the Black community. And we are one of the only 
research and policy shops in the city of Chicago that is dedicated to the black community. Many of you know that every year or often uh, we publish the state of black Chicago. The last time we published, published it was in 2019. We are publishing it this year and I'll give you a preview. We are going to talk about the cost of being black. We know that there are certain things that cost more in the black community. We know that there are certain costs associated with uh, the black community. I'll give you an example, uh, home appraisers. We know that a home in a South Side neighborhood, Inglewood or South Shore or Grand Crossings can appraise at one amount there. If you pick that home up and move it to the North Side or to a predominantly white community, it will appraise at tens of thousands more. We're going to actually explore that very subject during our Black History program on February 17th at six o'clock. Uh, we will have the Region 5 Administrator of HUD who will open that program, but we're going to have a panel on not just the problem of unfair appraisals or inequitable appraisals, but what are some of the solutions that we are coming up with? And that whole work is coming out of our research and policy center. They're also uh, working on an R3 planning grant around community reparations. Most of us are familiar with the concept of reparations in terms of a direct payment, but what do community reparations look like? How do we get our community involved with reparations in a way that uh, will create programming, create systems, and address institutional systems that have been a problem for our community that will be about the business of rectifying 400 years of subjugation and discrimination. So that's what the Urban League is up to. Uh, we invite you to engage with us. We are finishing a renovation at our site. And in fact, on March 5th, we're going to have a vaccine event at the league from 10 to one. And we would uh, invite you because not only are we going to be providing vaccinations and boosters, we're gonna be talking about mental health. We know that suicides are up. We know that um, the pandemic has really operated as one mass trauma event for all of us. Think about it. Whenever you hear about a new variant of, of COVID-19, whenever you hear about the death toll, whenever you hear about some of the other challenges, the loss of jobs, the loss of housing, all of these have uh, really impacted our community in a traumatic way. And we're going to talk about that on March 5th at the Chicago Urban League 4510 South Michigan. We hope you'll join us there. Um, when I think about the opportunity to um, work with this organization and work with an amazing team there, and we do have an amazing team, I think about my own journey and how that's really taken me. Uh, Karen or Clerk Yarborough uh, was able to uh, give you just um, a, a window into my journey. So I'm not gonna repeat that. But I, what I will say is that my parents raised me to serve. Uh, my father was a steel worker, but he was active in the community. My mother um, was a building coordinator for one of our community organizations, Gary Neighborhood Services. But as far back as I can remember, she was serving the community. She was a uh, secretary initially for the NAACP, our local branch of the NAACP. And in seeing her do that, and as an only child, being in adult meetings and hearing them talk about seeking justice, 
fair housing, fair employment, uh, public accommodations, all of those things that she worked on early in her career. And then to see her uh, in a building that administered daycare and the WIC program and other needs in the community, it made me want to serve the community. Um, I was uh, privy to VISTA volunteers as a little girl, and I understood the good that they did. And of course, they're AmeriCorps now, but I understand the good that they did in the community. And so um, I think that I was raised to serve. And then as a seven-year-old, I had the opportunity to meet Richard Gordon Hatcher for the first time and to hear him as a candidate talk about the things that he wanted to do in the community. I knew that I wanted to be the mayor too. Now, it didn't occur to me that there had never been a female mayor. It didn't occur to me that he was a man, but over the next 20 years, I was able to watch him serve our community. And he had a particular way of making himself available to young people that uh, really motivated me towards that goal. Now I took a, a bit of a circuitous route, admittedly. I served as the civil rights director for the state of Indiana and then as a city judge and then as Indiana Attorney General, and even as the director of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And I always thought, you know, Lord, I really want to be the mayor of my city. Maybe that's not what you have for me, because after all, I lost two elections before I was ultimately elected. But what I ultimately realized was that every other opportunity that I was blessed with, every other position that I served in equipped me to be the mayor because I was able to understand how the state of Indiana worked. I was under, able to understand how the federal government worked. And by the time I became mayor, that information was really, really important to my service. And what I'll tell you is now that I'm with the Chicago Urban League, that helps in my service there because uh, what I always tell people is that I get to do the same work. I just don't have to worry about the snow, the garbage or the potholes. And so when I see the streets and when I see potholes, I think to myself, somebody ought to do something about that. But the good news, is that somebody is not me. And so uh, it's an honor to be with you. I think I'm gonna stop there and just give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have because I know how it is to listen to a talking head and I'm not gonna be uh, the, the uh, owner of that head today. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you so very much for sharing your story uh, during our Black history. Um, I, I did not know all of what I just heard from you. I, I know a little bit about your background, but oh my goodness, you said some things that are very, um, that I got import from because I know that sometimes we, when we embark upon a journey, we think we know where we're going and then we take these um, side steps or what have you. Mm -hmm. And then that's where we really need to be. But you are uniquely qualified for where you are. And I, I might say that the world is your oyster and you're not through yet. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I tell people I'm out of the politics game. I, I'm not <laughs> mad at you. I'm not mad at you. We have uh, a, um, let's see, uh, in the chat, uh, you mentioned community reparations. What is your opinion on the city of Evanston's uh, recent attempt to make reparations to his Black residents, including the proposed housing grants to select families? Now, I got to tell you that at the end of this month, we're going to have uh, uh, Mayor Daniel Biss to come on, and he's going to explain this in, in detail because I, I wondered how the, the you know the what where 
I mean, I guess I know the where, but the how. So what is your opinion of that reparations um, program they have? So I was uh, following that as that process worked. And I think that that's certainly one way of, of um, doing reparations to provide housing stipends or housing dollars, because we know uh, that housing is one way to build wealth. Um, you know, I often wonder, and I'd be interested to hear what the, the mayor says, about the ability to do it on a widespread basis. Now, the good news is with ARPA dollars, there is more of an ability to do programming like that, that is transformational, that is exceptional. But I like to really think about uh, reparations in addition to individual stipends um, as a way of changing systems. As an example, how do we change the school system so that where you live does not um, impact your ability at, to get a good education? How do we um, impact the uh, housing uh, system in terms of the way that houses are assessed, the way that houses are appraised? so that we have an equitable system again, no matter where you live. So I, I think that that is certainly one way to do reparations and I was glad to see Evanston do it. I always think about how you scale programs like that. So I'd be interested and in, maybe that's a question you can ask the mayor, how can they scale that program and what does scaling look like? Well, I would ask that you, if you have a couple minutes in your schedule um, on the, what, the 24th, I believe it is, to tune in with us because I we're going to be asking him lots of questions. Yeah. I'll have one of our staff people to send you the link Please, uh, for, for awesome. that meeting. I noticed that on, on your website that you focused, um, you know, where it talks about home ownership because you said that home is where the wealth is and that is how we build generational wealth. And I certainly um, uh, agree with you on that. Um, during the 50s and through the 70s almost, the contract, are you familiar with the Contract Buyers League and the, the um, initiative that they had um, during that time where people who came from the South, you know, I guess this would have been the second wave coming from the South yes. and they were just looking for housing, okay? And they were, um, I guess, hoodwinked into, um, they thought they were purchasing properties, they were paying a down payment, they would move into the home. Um, in some cases, the person who sold the home to them, so, so called sold the home, they didn't even own it. And if the person lost I mean, if they did not pay one payment, they get tossed out and they would, you know, do it again. Are you familiar with the work that the Contract Buyers League did? I did hear about that. Yes, I have heard about that. I'm going to uh, provide you with the study that was done that shows that over 50, I, I think he said billion dollars that are owed to people on the west side and the south side of Chicago during that time where people were, again, hoodwinked into plowing money into unsafe just about uninhabitable um, properties, and they're looking for reparations in in that area. I was just wondering if you please knew send that to me. I will. I'd I like to include that in in the planning work that we're doing because there are specific instances like that, um, like what we saw in um, on Black Wall Street. There are specific instances where. Uh, Blacks have been taken advantage of in the past, and that is a specific class of folks who yes. need to be made whole. I, I, I agree. Um, we actually had, um, and you know, we have the recorder of deeds in our office now. Um, we, we have those duties and responsibilities. And we actually um, met with a woman who went through that. Her family was actually moved out of their property uh, because they missed a payment and uh, the contract buyers leak people they moved them right back in you know so there's a there's there's a lot of study that has gone into this 
and they need to be made whole. I agree with you, and I'll make that information uh, available to you. Um, there was one other thing, by the way, the Evanston project is being funded through the marijuana tax. So I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from, from him. There's a question here about um, the uh, training and communication community engagement activities of the Urban League. Are those uh, open to Proviso Township residents? Or you know, just for absolutely. The absolutely. In fact, um, we did a, um, a session over in Forest Park uh, with Isaiah Brandon. Okay. Uh, where we did a um, entrepreneurship fair and just talked about um, in this instance, we were talking about branding and business startups, but yes, we, we are in the Chicagoland area. Now, a lot of our work uh, occurs in the city, but as an example, we are currently doing work um, in workforce development, um, in housing, no, workforce development, entrepreneurship, and youth and family services down in Dalton, Madsen, and Harvey. And uh, like I said, in uh, Proviso Township, we're looking at uh, entrepreneurship out there. Wow, just wow. Okay, um, let's see, someone asked, what else do we have here? Hey, do we have anybody on this call that would like to just ask a question? Um, we'll unmute you to allow you to ask your question. Well, I'm looking at, um, oh, Concordia University, and you've already said that you will be happy to discuss a partnership with Concordia. I'm gonna uh, put my email in the chat just so that um, anyone who wants to reach out can do that. Okay, gr great. Can I add to that, Karen? Sure. Um, we This club, uh, prior to my being involved in the board and the leadership uh, in their generosity opened the doors to members to come in to be a part of this club with the idea that they would eventually start a club on the west side of Chicago, a rotary club that would help kind of focused on business development, entrepreneurship. One of our members is just finishing his PhD in, on leave, returning this June, and I think he'd like to be a part of that discussion as well. And, and uh, there's also a couple of other folks interested in making a larger rotary presence on the west side for the sake of new business development and just making a better quality of life for the residents there. So I, I, it's not really a question, but I'm kind of throwing that out there that we'd like to continue this conversation some more, I think. Absolutely, we would absolutely want, want to be involved in that conversation. Sure, please include us. I had one other question, it might be too big for our time today, but uh, it, it seems like your efforts are limitless, you know, it, it's only limited by the, the needs that exist, right? And, and I just wondered if in your long range plan, if you could share, give us a little peek at two or three initiatives that might be down the road that you ha haven't launched yet. Absolutely. So um, one of the long range plans that we are engaged in is um, we are a part of the One Central Transit Oriented Development. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, that's a little odd um, for the league to be involved in something like that. Uh, they may do development that's adjacent to the office, but we are in, engaged in this global effort. Um, and we are also involved in the, um, we are in the hunt for the casino bids. And the reason that we chose to partner in these specific ways is because of what we have seen during the course of time when people are engaged in development in the city of Chicago and quite frankly, just about any other city. And I certainly saw it when I was in Gary and it really fueled my desire to bring something different to uh, the city of Chicago. And the way that it typically goes is somebody starts a development and I got letters this week, same thing, saying we're engaged in a development. 
And we're looking to reach out to diverse businesses and uh, diverse employees. And then we direct people in that way and they say, oh, we have enough. Or um, we already have people from the union hall. And I get it, but the city requires them to send this letter in out and they are able by sending it to us to check that box and then to uh, turn it. And it, you know, it happens in Chicago, but it also happens in Maywood and it happens in uh, suburban communities too. And so what we said was, what if we worked hand in hand with the developer to create those opportunities in a very intentional way? so that the development would not occur without creating so many business opportunities. And, you know, even when those uh, black and other businesses of color came to, to the table, we would provide bonding, we would provide insurance, we would provide a funding pool so that those businesses would not have any barrier to participation in the development we would do the same with training and um, childcare and any barriers that needed to be removed for employment and that we would create a fund that would not only look at development in, on site. So as it relates to the case of One Central, the site is right between the museum campus and McCormick Place but we could do it all the way down the South Side corridor. And so what happens now is that we're gonna create a fund that would be funded at $20 million a year over the course of 10 years, where we would be able to leverage that $200,000, uh, $200 million and invest along the South and West corridor. And that's unique. It's unique for community-based organizations. It's even unique among urban leagues, but that's something that's sort of a big idea that we think will allow us to move the needle. So that's one of the sort of five-year projection. The other is that there are many community-based organizations who are doing amazing work but they don't necessarily have the capacity to administer an R3 grant, or they don't have the capacity to engage with the city or to engage with the county or to engage with the state. What we are doing is building with the Booth School at the University of Chicago and our impact program that I uh, described to you earlier is actually uh, being done in conjunction with the Booth School. So we would, we are now developing a second program called Ignite with the Booth School that will focus on uh, nonprofit leaders to help them grow capacity, to help them build their um, own leadership capacity so that they will then be able to build the organization and ultimately they will be able to engage at a, a wider level in the community. So we're excited about those two initiatives. We're also excited about growing our next one program. This was the first year that we brought it back and uh, we see that as helping businesses to scale, again, helping them to build wealth. And here's what we know about black business owners, they are like more likely to hire uh, from their communities. They are more likely to reinvest and be charitable uh, givers in their communities. And so when you help black businesses grow, you are ultimately investing and helping the community to grow. Okay, um, this last question is from uh, one of our members and he's asking whether you are familiar with the recent passage of the restrictive covenant law in Illinois 
our office would like to partner with the Urban League to get the message out to, com to the community. Now, this is especially, I mean, it can be anywhere, really, but um, to the community to help people remove such language from their deeds or their chain of title. Are you familiar with that um, restricted covenant law? I did see the news coverage of that law, and I would love to partner. That is absolutely what our housing and financial empowerment centers should be engaged in. So please reach out to me so that I can connect you with that team so that we can get involved in making people aware of that. We have trainings every week, either new home buyers, existing home buyers. Uh, so we have access to people. And then that's something that we just wanna raise and highlight and so uh, Fair Housing Month is coming up as an example. We could do a convening around Fair Housing Month. That, yeah, that's a great idea. I don't yeah. think that many people, I mean, most people don't look at their deed anyway. You know, they put it in a safety deposit box and yeah. never to be seen or heard from again. But there are, you know, since they passed this law, um, we actually um, developed a, a process in how we're going to address this in the recorder of deeds office. So, so he wanted to make you aware that we, we want people to know they don't have to have that on their chain of title. Yes. Um, while they don't see it, it's there and it's offensive. It's just offensive. It absolutely you know. is. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole um, basis for uh, a raisin in the sun, if you uh, remember. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. So I'm thinking that there would be a Fair Housing Month event that could center around the restrictive covenant laws, law, uh, the recent passage, and to highlight the uh, work about the folks who are looking for rep reparations because of their contract. Uh, contract, contract, yeah, needs. contract yeah. buying. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then also we do the uh, property after death workshop showing people oh, yeah. how- Yeah, no, we need to get that back on. Yeah, on yeah. Point. Transferring yeah. their homes, their cars, mm -hmm. and their bank accounts. You know, I what I've found in, in my time you know, in, in community and trying to help people navigate through things and stuff, you know, just the basics. If they have the information, they can be their best advocate. And so the, the Urban League just appears to be that agency that wants to transmit information to people so they can help themselves. We absolutely want to do that. And, you know, one of the uh, things that I'm very passionate about, I was passionate about it when, when I was mayor and continue to be, is the challenge with vacant and abandoned property that we have in our communities. And when you think about that challenge, so much of that property is vacant or abandoned because there has not been a, um, a transfer from someone who is elderly to the next generation. And either people don't know or the person died before it could be done and they are stuck because lawyers can be expensive. And so to be able to assist prior to so that people will know and provide that information, I think that's, uh, that's priceless. Well, great. Madam, Mayor, Madam, President, Madam, Madam. Just call me Karen. <laughs> and you know what? That's what I tell people. Just call you Karen. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. You shared so much information um, to our members and also to my employees. There are a number of my employees that uh, tuned in on their lunch today uh, to, to hear from you. So I so appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for uh, sharing your time, your talent and resources of the Chicago Urban League. But I tell you what, I'm looking for, uh, you know, Karen ain't through yet. She's not through <laughs> yet, you know. I don't know where you're going from here, but I'm just glad you where you are so you can make the difference that you want to make in community. So I'm gonna turn the microphone 
over to the president so that he can close out. I asked Frank to um, post the uh, property after death uh, workshop. Um, the, we have this coming up, Karen. Um, oh, yeah. Working, yeah, we're working with Congressman Davis on this one, and we're going to be at Malcolm X College. And this is the same one that we've done at the Urban League. So I, we I, have to have you back at the league. We're, I'm ready, I'm I'm, I'm ready willing, it. and able. Okay. Yes. I'll All have right. Robin, yeah, I'll have Robin Staggers to reach back uh, out to the Urban League, and we'll get that on our calendar because we want to um, help some people understand how they can uh, address, you know, their generational wealth. Absolutely, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. President.